Praise the Lord. We're glad that you chose to join with us tonight for the Wednesday night Bible study at the Bible Heritage Pentecostal Holiness Church in Waycross, Georgia. I'm Pastor Randy Richardson. And let's start this service by singing a, a song I love to sing. It's called My Sins Are Gone. I'm thankful that the Bible says that when the Lord forgives us, he remembers our sins no more. Hallelujah. Praise God. says what can wash away my sins nothing but the blood of Jesus hallelujah
Teal River spirit that's been assigned to these folks that are watching by way of internet today. I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that they will be loosed for the glory of God. Satan, take your hold off of God's people. They do not belong to you. They've been bought with a price. They've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus. And you've got no business. You're a squatter. Get off of them. Move from their lives in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, verse 9 by itself. We glanced at it last week, but today we're going to take it apart. And I've entitled this message, Dealing with Guilt. Dealing with Guilt. Almost all of us, if we're honest, would say there are things that we feel guilty for. There are things that, you know, are healthy guilt that brings us to a place of repentance those are healthy things but sometimes I know myself we can get locked into certain emotions we can get locked in in our minds thinking that we coulda we shoulda we if we'd have done it this way or that way and you know we we, we have a lot of guilt that is from Satan it's invented in our own mind sometimes Sometimes we're our worst enemy. Satan doesn't have to do very much because we do enough to ourselves in the flesh. Maybe you've had a bad marriage or uh, your children are wayward or you're, you're going through some difficult time and the enemy is just uh, plundering your mind with guilt. Well, tonight I want to address that and I want you to be free in the name of Jesus. Some time ago, I met a lady. I was pastoring in Jacksonville. A lady comes into the church. She says, I need to talk to you. I said, okay, let's go to my office. So we went in the office. And she says, Pastor, I'm the spawn of Satan. Well, it kind of caught me off guard because, I mean, nobody ever says that. I mean, never said it to me in my whole life and then or since. And uh, she says, uh, I, I, I'm just evil and, and I'm full of guilt she says, God has, I've, I've committed the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and, and I cannot be forgiven and no matter how much I've tried and others have prayed for me and quoted the word to me and she said, I cannot find comfort and I cannot find forgiveness. And no matter how much of the word of God I quoted to that woman about God being able to forgive her, she would not accept it. Her guilt for her past, her guilt for her hatred towards her mother, she could not forgive herself and wound up uh, with extremely unhealthy guilt. If I was dealing with her today, with the knowledge that I have today, I would have rebuked the devil in the name of Jesus off of her and then I might have had some success with talking to her, but the, she needed deliverance first and then counseling with the word of God afterward. It was easier to not forgive herself 
than to deal with the issues at hand. One of my favorite scriptures is our text tonight, 1 John 1, 9. If, circle that word, if, if we confess our sins, so that means you got a part to play in this. You have a role to play in this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Glory to the name of Jesus. Why is it then that we continuously struggle with guilt? What is guilt? It's feeling bad for something that happened in our life. Now, the Holy Spirit uses our conscience and brings conviction into our heart. Not guilt, but conviction. And conviction says, if you do this, there's a consequence for it. But if you confess that sin, God will cast it in the depths of the sea. He'll remember it no more. He'll bring it up. It's like you ask him about that sin I committed five days ago. And he's like, what sin? I don't know what you're talking about. I forgave you of your past. I don't forgive you of what you asked me to forgive you for. The Holy Spirit deals with us as children. And he deals with us to remind us that God loves us enough that he wants to keep us in holiness, in righteousness, not of our own, but through him. But every time we sin, we should feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law, talking about the Bible, shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do. To observe to do according to all that's written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So if you want to live a blessed life, you need to be in that word, be in the word of God. And allow that word to resonate in your spirit. David said, I hide I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because I've read the Bible through so many times and I've been a student of the word all my life, I know the scriptures. And the scriptures come to my mind if I'm about to sin or if I have sinned or if I've done something that's not right or not pleasing to the Lord. David said in Psalm 17, 4, he said, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. In other words, he said, God's word has kept me from so many things that the enemy wanted to destroy in my life. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows your motives. He knows what's behind your actions. God knows why you did what you did. We might as well come clean. Let me say this before I go any further. If you have no conviction, if you don't feel bad when you sin, if you don't feel that tug on your heart to get clean before the Lord, you're not born again and you need to get right with God and do it today. Do it right now. When do we feel guilt? We feel guilt when we commit some sin and we feel bad about it. We feel guilt at or after somebody's dying or they have just died and we experience those, I wish I had, I should have, I didn't. I could have people that manipulate you. Man, I tell you, in my lifetime, I've been manipulated so many, so many times. 
And another person can bring guilt into your life by manipulating you with the words that they say. Even a church can manipulate you. A pastor can mani manipulate you. And so those bring on guilt. Husbands, wives can bring guilt. Children can throw up things that happen. Let me tell you about your childhood. It was your childhood. Whatever it was, get over it. Just get over it. It's in the past. Forgive your parents if they did anything wrong. Just move on, you know. But for the grace of God, just forgive them and move on. The Bible is full of people who experienced guilt. Adam and Eve hiding in the Garden of Eden after they took of the forbidden fruit. Cain trying to explain Abel's death to God. Noah drunk and naked. Abraham casting Hagar and Ishmael out of his home. And just with a, a, a donkey with a few things to eat and, and just sent them on their way. Jacob wrestling with an angel. Joseph's brothers groveling uh, there before him in Egypt. Moses striking the rock. And, and Achan stashing the Babylonian garment in his, under his tent. And Samson waking up in Delilah's lap with his hair cut off and his covenant broken with the Lord and his power gone. David hearing Nathan's uh, riddle and the, and the bony little finger pointing at him saying, Thou art the man. The adulterous woman thrown at Jesus' feet. The Samaritan woman at the well who heard Jesus say, You have five husbands and the one that you're living with is not your husband. Judas Iscariot trying to return the 30 pieces of silver after he realizes he's betrayed the Son of God. Peter denying the Lord and cursing and carrying on and hearing the rooster crow. Guilt came on the scene. John 16, 7 and 8 says, Therefore I tell you the truth that's expedient for you, that I go away, and if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he is come, he will reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Thank God for the Holy Ghost who convicts us when we sin and when we do wrong. He brings us back. If we're led of the Spirit, if we trust in the Lord with all of our minds and lean not to our own understandings but acknowledge him in all our ways, he will direct our paths. The Holy Spirit will remind you of a truth in God's Word. That's why it's so important that we read the Bible so we know God's Word. It reveals things in good conviction to our mind. Paul told Timothy to keep a good conscience. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19, he said, This charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. This is true. Some people reject a good conscience. Romans 8, I mean Romans 2, 14 and 15. Romans 2, 14 and 15 says, when the Gent For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these all they, they do not have the law are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So Paul saying people that don't even have the word have a conscience and, 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 and it deals with them. Every normal person is born with a capacity of conscience. Some children, though, because of abuse and the way their parents uh, raise them and uh, torture them sometimes, and they wind up growing up and becoming monsters with no conscience. That's why it's so important to raise your children in church and to keep them knowing the word of God, to keep them sensitive to the Holy Spirit, because we're living in a wicked world and they need to understand who the Holy Ghost is and how he convicts us and teaches us and helps us along the way. 
So if I sin, and I use that word if, I sin, because we should not be sinning all the time. If we make a mistake or we sin uh, through some mistake or some falling to human error, then we need to ask the Lord to forgive us. But some people just are like in a revolving door of sin. They just stay in it and keep going round and round and round and round and round. I have a Savior who's not untouched by the feeling of my infirmity, but in all ways was tempted like I am. And he understands me, and I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find help in the time of trouble. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is himself the propitiation or the payment for our sins, and not for ours, but also for the whole world. So it's important that when you sin, you go before the Lord and get clean. Ask him to forgive you every single day. Just don't even wait till bedtime to say your prayers. If you sin at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, then you need to, at 2.01, you need to say, Father, I just did so and so. You say, well, I'm at work. Well, there's a lot. You, you can pray under your breath. God can hear your thoughts. You pray under your, under your breath and your mind just say, Lord, forgive me for what I was thinking. Lord, forgive me for what I said. Lord, forgive me. And make things right before the Lord. When a person is afflicted with guilt, which confession of sin does not relieve, that guilt is self-imposed. I'm going to say that again because it's important for you to get this. When a person is afflicted with guilt, which confession or praying to God and asking to forgive you does not relieve the guilt, it's you. It's self-imposed. The result is self-condemnation. The problem is now more emotional and mental than it is spiritual because God said he'd forgive us that quick. As soon as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing you can do that God will not forgive you outside of blasphemy and the Holy Ghost. The issue now is more with yourself rather between you and God. It's between you and your own thoughts. This is unhealthy guilt. And you need to get deliverance from it. You need to retrain your brain. <laughs> when people say things like, I've prayed over and over and over and I just can't seem to get forgiveness. I don't feel forgiven. Then that is an unhealthy guilt. And it's all right up here. If you find yourself in this category, I want to give you a quick formula to help you begin retraining your conscience to have a healthy guilt. Acknowledge your need for healing in this area of your life. Romans 8 1 says, Therefore, now there is no condemnation. Hallelujah! There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Realize the only person that's condemning you is you. If others are condemning you, examine yourself and say, are, is, is what they're saying correct? Sometimes my wife will see something in me that I don't see in myself, and she'll say, you need to work on this. And instead of arguing with her and saying, no, I don't, which I have done, all men do that, but after I walk away, I go before the Lord and say, is she right, Lord? Is that right? Did, did, I, did I do that? Do I, do I need to change in that area? Will you help me? And then I make things right with the Lord and I get his wisdom on whether what I did was right or not. And then I go make things right with her because I did it in front of her. I do it in front of the girls. I'll ask them to forgive me. But when, when guilt cannot be relieved through praying and praying through 
until you get the, 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 the forgiveness of sin and you get your mind cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, then it's unhealthy. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Hallelujah. Man, when you get right with God, everything becomes new. You can put the past behind you. I, I fell into sin back in 2003 or 2000, no, 2002, the end of that year and the first of 2003, and I backslid, and I'm not proud of that. But I'm going to tell you what, it took me five years to forgive myself. Now, there's some people that still haven't forgiven me for that. There's some people that point their finger at me and say, you did so and so. And label me with that name till the day I die. Or they'll, on my funeral bed, they'll, they'll say, well, there lies Ranger Rickson, and in 2002, he backslid. And he did this and he did that. Well... You know what? The minute that I confessed it, and I can remember the day, I, 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 I don't remember the actual calendar today, but I remember the day, it was a, a Friday night or a Saturday night, and I was in a minute market in the restroom cleaning up a mess. And I said, Father, if, you, if I can clean this mess up, you can clean this mess up. And Jesus Christ cleansed me right there in that bathroom, and I felt the Holy Ghost come on me and cleansed me and set me free. But Randy could not forgive Randy for five years. It, I, every time I went into a, 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 another church or I saw another minister that had known me in the past, and all I could do was feel the condemnation that the devil was trying to make me feel. And, 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 and so we, we, we cannot allow the enemy to do that in our lives. And I know now what I should have done in the very beginning to forgive myself by faith. And I want to help other people get there. Hallelujah. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So you can change the way you think about everything. There's sometimes that my mind will get me thinking negative thoughts. And I'll begin to think of, well, it could go this way and it could go that way. And I start meditating on, on how all the scenarios and I try to work it out in my mind. And, and it's not pleasing to the Lord me doing that. That's just a bad habit I've developed over the years. And, and, and then you do the shouldas. I, I ought to have done this or I should have done that or or. or it's all or nothing thinking. It's either this way or that way, and there's nowhere in the middle that it could possibly turn out, and, 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 and there's another category of uh, catastrophic thinking and mind reading and blaming, uh, general overgeneralization, negative filtering, all kinds of things that I wish I had more time to get into, but these are negative thinking that brings guilt into our lives. Start catching yourself feeling guilt feelings. I mentioned in, in the service, Sunday was a week ago, where I had that technical problem and I uploaded the wrong video and normally at two or three days I would beat myself up for that. But I'm learning how to stop the devil from bringing guilt into my life that is not right. And so, you know, we, we got to make sure that we are uh, having a healthy relationship with the Lord and a healthy relationship with other people, and guilt has no place. But you know what? There's a lot of people that like to throw guilt on you. If you, if you don't do so-and-so, you don't love me. If you really cared about me, you do thus and so. And they manipulate you and manipulate you and manipulate you. And, 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 and so you wind up with all this baggage, all this guilt in your life, and, and God wants to set you free from that. You say, well, how, how can I get free from that? Well, you begin to recognize when you're doing it. Just like me that last Sunday, after about an hour and a half, 
I realized there is no fast fix for this. And after it crashed three different times on the computer, I tried to upload it on the iPad, and I tried to do it in different ways, and different systems, and nothing. And for six hours, I sat at that computer trying to fix that problem. But the devil was trying to beat me up about it. But I recognized it. And instead of doing the two or three day tour, I did the Gilligan two to three hour tour <laughs> with, with the devil tormenting my mind until I finally had enough and said, no devil, I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to let you manipulate me into guilt for something that was just a mistake. Now, there are some folks that they don't even have a conscience. The Bible calls it their conscience is seared with a hot iron. That's 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Well, how do you fix this? First, believe that God can help you correct a faulty conscience. Let's say you were in a bad marriage, and all the devil's done is bring up every bad thing you ever did that, that you feel like caused the situation. Let it go. Let it go. Whatever happened, happened. Just in your own mind, say, Father, if I sinned in any way in that way and I hadn't confessed it yet, I confess it before you. Bring to my mind anything I need to confess. And you know what? God will start filling your mind with thoughts and things that you need to ask him for. It might take you a few hours of just sitting and meditating, reading the word of God and praying. And, and God will reveal to you these things. But then when you see that it's just guilt, guilt, guilt for things you've already asked the Lord, you've already asked the partner, you know, whatever, to forgive you, you just simply say that whole mess now, I'm going to wrap it up in a little pretty package, and I'm going to give it to God and let God do whatever he wants to in the sea of forgetfulness. Hallelujah. God can fix the biggest messes that I or you can ever have. I've had some huge mistakes in my life. I've done some things that I'm not proud of. There's some things that I, I, I could carry huge guilt for, but I have received forgiveness and it's gone. It's under the blood of Jesus. So why go grab it and bring it back through the blood to carry it when God has already set me free? Jacob in the Old Testament could no longer, God could no longer call him Jacob, which meant supplanter and deceiver. He changed his name to Israel, meaning a person who has power with God. Mary Magdalene, she didn't feel guilty when she was making her living as a prostitute. However, when she came to Christ, he healed her conscience and he changed her character so that she was one of the greatest uh, matriarchs in the church. In her time, Paul went through a great transformation experience when he became a Christian. He went from being a Christian killer to leading the Christian church as one of the great apostles. We need to concentrate your spiritual efforts. You'll have to work very hard to get victory over it. I have to, I've, I've learned uh, some of the triggers in my own life of things that kick in this guilt complex. I was raised to feel guilty all the time. And, and, and so I had to overcome that and I had to forgive some people that did that to me. And, and then when uh, family members or friends or whatever try to throw that back onto me, I have to say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not the city dump. Don't dump that on me. I'm not... You know, I'm not going there. And then I got some relatives that I can't say a word because it just caused an argument. So they dump and I just turn around and take it off of me and throw it on to the Lord and cast all my cares on the Lord because he cares for me. Those who have the greatest struggle in this area that just seem to not be able to get past it are those who have unhealthy guilt that's rooted in rules more than relationship. So what are you talking about? Well, there's some people that can't get past how the rules are, how it's supposed to be, you know, and 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 so they 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 want the the they want their religion of rules 
don't play cards, don't go to the beach, don't play baseball, don't, you know, all the old things that people used to say don't do, don't go to the movies, and, 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 and on and on. Well, they can do those things because it's just checking a widget or checking off a box that you've done this and done this, and okay, now I get to go to heaven. But that's a miserable way to live by rules. We need to live by relationships. Because when I'm living by relationship, I don't want to sin because I don't want to hurt the heart of God. It's not because the Bible says thou shalt not. It's because I will hurt the heart of God. So I don't want to do it. Unhealthy guilt inflicts a lot of pain in your heart and your emotions and your mind. In the dark ages, people used to whip themselves and they crawled on glass and they walked up and down stairs on their knees and until they bled and bled and, and, and it, it never made them feel better. It just didn't cure the problem because we have to go by faith and say, Father, I need your help. I need your forgiveness and then I need to be able to walk in forgiveness. So I accept that I'm saved by faith. I accept that I'm healed by faith. So I accept the Lord. He's got a place in heaven for me by faith. I just know I've got a mansion waiting on me. Hallelujah. So why can't I accept the fact that God has forgiven me and whatever I did in the past is under the blood. It's gone. It's history. The mistakes that I made are, are in the past and there's nothing I can do about it. And, and, and all the worry in the world and all the fretting in the world is not going to change the situation. So what do you do? You just say, okay, God, here it is. Here's this awful marriage. Here's this bankruptcy, Lord. Here's this child situation. Here's this work problem, Lord. Here's this neighbor problem, God. Here's this sickness and disease that I have. And we go before the Lord and we just give him. We give him. We give him. The devil has stolen days, weeks, months, and years in some people's life because of guilt. Tormenting folks. The Bible says, John 10, 10 thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that you might have life and life more abundantly. Jesus does not want you operating in guilt. He doesn't want you under the, uh, the uh, burden of guilt. He wants you free. Make up your mind to do what Paul wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He said, Brother, I, have, I do not count myself to, to apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. Forgetting all those people I fed to the lions, that I had their bodies torn apart by horses, that I had wild animals eating them in the arenas, all the babies and the children and the youth and the women and the old folks that I tormented. God, I put all those things behind me and I'm reaching forward to those things that are ahead and I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So if Paul said, I've got to, I've got to put it behind me, don't you think it's time to put it behind you? Whatever it is that you're feeling guilty about, if it's sin and that tug of the Holy Ghost is there, that's conviction, pray, get forgiveness, it's gone. If it's something that you did that you can't forgive yourself for, just immediately say, I, I forgive myself. One thing I like to do a lot of times is I like to write a, a, just a piece of paper I take and I write all the feelings that I feel and the emotions and the hatred and the bitterness and the, and the heartache and all the stuff that I'm going through. I write it all down. And then I take a, a, a match and I light it and I burn it, and I say, all right, now, God, as all this junk goes up to you, it reminds me that on this day, I gave this mess to you. Now, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person that's listening to the sound of my voice. 
Father, I pray that your word will reach down in their spirits and help them as they're struggling with guilt. Father, if it's conviction, that's from you. And let them repent and it be cleansed and forgiven and forgotten in Jesus' name. But Father, if it's something that they can't forgive themselves for, if it's something that others have manipulated into their lives, God, whatever it is, we put it in a package right now and we turn around and we hand it to you. We cast all of our care on you today. And when we start to pick it back up, Lord, remind us that on this night, we gave it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord, not to take it back up. Hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight in the study of the word. And uh, we want to remind you that if you're, uh, you need to send in your tithes because we're not having in-person services until uh, uh, February the uh, 7th, maybe even a week or two after that, depending on what's going on in our area. But, but watch us online, and if you have your tithes and you need to send them in, mail them to 816 Columbus Street, uh, Waycross, Georgia, 31503. Or if you're local and you want to just put it in my mailbox, give me a call and let me know you did it. And then we'll be glad to uh, give it to Sister Sandy to post. Be with us Sunday morning online on Facebook or either on uh, YouTube. And uh, we'll have a great service uh, Sunday. God bless and have a blessed rest of your week.